So, you, you know, you've got a you've got a situation today where, um, across the educational spectrum in both the United States and in the, and in the UK, you have wokeism uh, dominating. Now, arguably, this is a bit in a treat. Again, I, I I would mention I would mention Virginia and I would mention San Francisco. Uh, but it might be in retreat in some areas. It might be, but it's under the surface everywhere, and it's certainly, to a large extent, in many school districts, dictating much of the curriculum. And it seems to be very much alive and well here in the UK. Although, again, uh, you know, I've been speaking at a lot of schools, at high schools, uh, over the last um, five, six, seven years in the UK, in particular. Um, I, I, I've talked to a lot of students, and suddenly. Issues of race, an issue of sexual uh, orientation are ones that are seem to be particularly sensitive, overly sensitive, uh, and 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 dangerously so, uh, as a result of all this wokeness. But they let me speak and they let me present an alternative point of view to these kids. And the kids sometimes are the ones rebelling against it, but they are open at least to alternative point of views and. Um, they're allowing me in, into the classrooms. They're allowing me in front of these students. I give them, I give them a lot of credit. Uh, I give them a lot of credit for that. Anyway, the panel today had uh, how many? We were, we were five panelists, and it was it was quite interesting. So the first panelist was an American, a parent. I, I think I think a parent who's probably traditionally liberal, center left, um, who discovered what was being taught and was horrified and and became very active um, within the kind of parents' movement to, um, to uh, argue against uh, the uh, argue against wokeism in, uh, in schools in America. So she became uh, a real activist in the United States and she argued for kind of the uh, you know parental involvement in education. Uh, the second panelist was a teacher. A uh, really interesting guy, a, a teacher who clearly opposes a lot of this nonsense and who I think has a, uh, I'd say from, the, from, from what he said, what I understood from what he said, a quite a rational view of the role of education, the purpose of education. But his view is this is something that teachers have to handle. This is something that teachers are going to have to settle internally among themselves. Uh, that what needs to be, that, that woke needs to be something, the whole, the whole issue of what should be taught and the curriculum is not something parents should get involved in. Um, it should be, to a large extent, something that, um, that uh, you know, uh, teachers uh, should um, engage in and, and uh, that the problem, part of the problem is that there's no proper educational philosophy, that there's no clear idea of what education is for, and, and that he is trying to convince people, uh, you know, to, to go to basics to return to basics in terms of what is education, what's the purpose, and, and, and build from there, if you will, kind of a, 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 um, an opposition uh, to uh, the entry of woke and CRT uh, into the school districts. And, and I have to say, much of what he said uh, was, was quite good, although I think he, he, like many, I think, teachers and many people in, call it positions of power within the educational establishment, don't think much of, of of parents' involvement, and 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 one this left to the experts. Um, I spoke next. I'll get to what I said in a minute. But uh, to my left was a was a British parent who sends her kid to a private, what they call here, independent school, one of the top schools in the UK, uh, very high on academics, and um, uh, she is, uh, you know, so obviously she can afford to send her kid there. And she, again, I think, echoed the idea that parents need to be involved, that she was shocked by what, the, what was being taught, that she has gotten involved in the schools, that she is putting pressure. And she described the many difficulties in trying to reach the, the teachers, trying to reach the administrators, trying to get any uh, changes instituted in the schools. And, and her point was, this is not just a public school thing. This is in all schools, including the private schools. Um, and, uh, and that that uh, this is a, a, a real problem and parents better wake up and, and parents better get involved. I don't think there is real um, 
homeschooling in, in the UK. So I don't think homeschooling is a real alternative here. Um, and then the, the, the um, fifth panelist was a woman, um, a woman of color, I guess. I, I can't say what color, but, you know, very dark skin, but from Malaysia, originally from Malaysia. Uh, but could be easily mistaken for somebody uh, who was uh, who was from Africa. I mean, very dark skin, and she just railed against critical race theory, railed against all all this uh, race based identity politics. I mean, she was really good. I mean, really excellent. Uh, you, you know, echoed uh, the ideas of, I guess, ultimately Martin Luther King of. Of, of color blindness and and uh, and that all these preferential treatments ultimately are hurting people of color. So she was excellent on the whole racial issues and and uh, and why CRT is fundamentally wrong and, and needs to be abolished. And and what was interesting, the, the, uh, the, there was nobody on the panel trying to defend woke. There was nobody on the panel trying to defend. Um, uh, trying to defend uh, CRT, nobody on the panel trying to defend any kind of uh, explicitly leftist ideas, although they, you know, there were probably some in the audience. Um, but uh, one of the things I like about, what I find interesting about the Battle of Ideas is that it's put on by the, the, the Academy for Ideas and the Academy is old left. And uh, so they are much more likely to be old line Marxists interested in class, interested in uh, economic socialism, and it, it much more um, tend to be on the side of rejecting uh, the new left, rejecting uh, identity politics, rejecting woke, rejecting uh, very, very, very pro-free speech. I mean, Claire Fox, who heads up the academy and runs the Battle of Ideas, is, is a huge advocate for free speech. Uh, and uh, I've I've had a I think she participated in my discussion with uh, um, oh god my 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 aversion to remembering names has just kicked in again I remember his face the the British conservative who has written about uh, Islam and immigration um, uh, Douglas Murray no Douglas Murray yes Douglas Murray uh, she was on the panel with Douglas Murray and myself one of the events that there's a video of out there. Uh, anyway, she's very post free speech, but she's left on on on, on economics. Uh, it, but she is uh, uh, on on culture. She was pro Brexit. She is quite nationalist. She is uh, pro free speech. She is anti woke and anti CRT. So this weird modern mixture of uh, in, in in where I think most of the middle is forming, uh, and most of the political consensus seems to be around which is uh, conservative and social issues, um, anti-crazy left on social issues, pro-free speech, and, uh, but, but uh, left on, on anything to do with economics. And I think that's pretty much the political consensus, both in the U.S. and now uh, in the U.K., and, and probably in most of, Euro most of Europe, I think that is the consensus. So um, what's great about the Battle of Ideas is you got a wide spectrum of people, but it's kind of interesting. You'd expect to have kind of the wacky left better represented, but but they're really not. They're not there. So you have a wide variety of points of view, but but the wacky left is not quite there. So it, it was interesting. All the comments were, were really interesting, and all the comments were ones that I you know d d didn't. I mean, there were points that I disagreed with, but not 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 much of the spirit of it that I disagree with. But but I made the point. I made the point that. You know, while much of this, much of the issue here is really uh, a philosophical issues about the nature of education and about the role of education, what education should be about and whether it should get involved in uh, politics and, and, and in uh, uh, cultivating a particular morality, a particular political point of view. None of that was going to change. The real and the real problem, the real problem, I believe, is the the politicization of education, and I, I said that it was inevitable. That is, there was no way to avoid politicizing education as long as education was basically run by the state. And in particular in the UK, curriculum is determined by the higher-ups. Now, they don't 
dictate CRT and they don't dictate uh, woke, but they dictate much of the curriculum and they and they and they define kind of the 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 process of education and they set exams and 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 very much the same as in the United States. And there's a constant constant there's a constant um, war of ideas going on uh, over education. So, for example, in the United States, we have had the battle of creationism versus evolution for years in, in uh, various uh, conservative school districts. And, and that battle, I think, is ongoing. Uh, we now have battles over CRT. We have battles over a million different cultural issues. Uh, on the other hand, pretty uniformly, um, this is another example of the fact that everybody accepts leftist economics, um, there's basically, uh, basically uh, an acceptance a complete acceptance and, and, and no real opposition to the fact that the dominant history textbook that is taught in American schools, high schools, it was written by a Marxist, uh, Howard Zinn, uh, and, and that portrays America in a, in a very kind of Marxist perspective, particularly the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, uh, and the, the, the entire perspective that kids learn about economics through history, which is a very, very important perspective with regard to economics, you learn economic history, is a Marxist perspective, and that's in American schools. And, and again, everybody studies from the same textbook. And everything standardized, at least at the school board level, but even, even then, everybody is, is, is teaching to the standardized tests, and everything is standardized from above. And, um, and when, when new theories of how to teach math, how to teach reading, how to teach something else is taught by the colleges, everybody teaches it because everything is standardized and everything the same. And and public education dominates. And even though we have private schools in the UK and we have private schools in the US, they are not a factor and there's no real competition. The public schools dominate and the public schools, at the end of the day, set the agenda for what all curriculum will be because standardized tests apply to everybody, including the private schools. So my point was that to really deal with all these issues, including woke and CRT and so on, what we really need is to privatize education. What we really need is to get government out of education. And what we really need is to get parents much more involved in the educational process. I, I, you know, and I used as an example, I think I've used this on a show in the past, the example that Steve Jobs uh, gave in an interview that he did in the 1990s where he basically said parents spend significantly more time on choosing what shoes to wear than on choosing what school their kid will go to, choosing what kind of education their kid will get. There is lots of marketing to try to educate us with regard to shoes, <laughs> uh, automobiles, a million diff different things, institutions and products and values, we're constantly bombarded with advertising and marketing to try to educate them, us about the, the possibilities, about the, the array of products available to us. But the one area where you really don't see, where you really don't see um, competition, and you really don't see marketing, and you really don't see advertising, is education. You don't see billboards saying, hey, come to my school, we teach da 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 and I'll, you know, our kids go to Stanford, our kids go to whatever. You don't see that. Because there's no robust competitive educational system in America. What's interesting, what's interesting is that um, what's interesting is that uh, even though I went, I went third, I think I was in the middle of the debate, it turned out that this point about privatizing education and the role of parents and the significance of parents getting involved and making choices and getting involved in the education of their kids and taking responsibility for their kids really to a large extent became the talking point of the whole event and many of the audience comments and audience questions were related to it and, and it's interesting that when you go into a panel like this and you make some bold statement about a bold solution to a problem 
even though people might disagree with you, you tend to shape the, um, the tenor and the content of the actual debate that goes on afterwards, and people will remember what you say. Uh, I found that this happened yesterday as well uh, on the midterms in the United States. I, I found it because my statements were unequivocal, they were bold, they were, they were controversial, they were radical. Um, people paid attention. And people might have disagreed and might be upset and might be, and, and you could tell, they, but they paid attention and they listened and they had questions and they wanted to comment and they want to engage. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that the purpose of going on these panels? You're not going to convince anybody of anything. What you want is to engage them and make them curious and make them, make them think and make them challenge and question their beliefs. And if I say so myself, I think, I did that on both panels, uh, both yesterday uh, and today. And I do think that probably the most important question in education today is not what is being taught, this ideology or that ideology, because as we'll see, I, don't, I think the schools are not as powerful as you think they are. Um, it's culture that matters. But um, what's really important about education, the real education debate, should be about privatizing education. It's interesting that the national conservatives and many conservatives are anti-school choice. They're anti-privatizing anti, um, education. They want the state involved. They want the tool that the leftists had for so many years. They want it in their own hands. They want the power to control what is in the minds of our kids. It is really, really interesting if you read, and I think I pointed this out when we read the principles of national conservatism, that they want to be able to dictate curriculum for kids. They want to be able to inculcate Christian ethics into our educational system. They want to do what CRT and Woke have done. They want to do it from their side. They want the same opportunity. They want public schools because they want to be able to control the minds of kids. The only way to eliminate politics from education is to privatize it and to privatize it fully. Now, I, you know, as I've often said, I, I, am, I am willing to consider the idea of, uh, you know, some form of vouchers, uh, particularly in the form of education saving accounts, where, if you will, the state is paying for education, as long as the state doesn't limit what kind of education it's paying for, but it's paying for education, but the parents get to choose, the parents get to decide, the parents can homeschool, they can send them to religious school, they can send them to secular school, they can send them to a woke school, they can send them to a conservative, national conservative school, they can send them to any school they want, but that there is real competition between these schools. And I think most parents don't want to send their kids to woke schools. I don't think most parents don't want to send their kids to national conservative schools. I think most parents want to send their kids to schools that teach reading, writing, math, science, that teach the content, teach their kids how to think. I think that's the focus that most parents care about. Most parents couldn't articulate it. They couldn't talk about it. But that's partially because they have become brain dead to it because they've just outsourced the responsibility for educating their kids to the government, to the state. And there's nothing worse than giving the state that responsibility. I often ask parents, you wouldn't use the state to send an important letter across country. You use FedEx or UPS. I just realized I, I didn't use this example today in my talk. I should have. And yet you're willing to drop your kids off at the post office to have them educated by the postman every single day. Now, that's not an insult to teachers. It's, it's just a fact that when you're a government employee, the incentives, the motivations, the structures are going to be different. And of course, if you had private education, you wouldn't have a teacher's union as powerful, as strong, as influential, as dominating as it is in the United States. So in my view, the most important issue in education today is privatizing education, getting rid of the government, involved in education. In that sense, the best thing 
happening in education today is the education saving account bill that was passed in Arizona. And let's hope it will survive this coming election and, and will stay the law in, um, in Arizona. So I'm not so much for vouchers. I am much uh, more in support of an education saving account. Uh, that's at least uh, the U.S. solution. I'm, I, I don't know how it would apply in the U.K., but I'm sure there's a way to apply it in the United Kingdom as well. Um, that is uh, the real issue. Um, and, and I think that's the only way to, to, to get rid of, of uh, woke education today, woke education in the future, the next iteration of woke, the future woke, the future politicization, whether it comes again from the left or the right, get politics out of our education. Let parents actually choose. If parents are Christians and they want to send their kids to school that doesn't teach evolution, too bad for the kids, but let them do it. If parents are woke and they want to send their kids to a woke school, let them do it. But let's have real choice and real competition, real innovation in the educational space. I think we have video of the panel, so I'm hoping, I think you can see it on ARC UK. Um, I'll also probably put it up on my channel. If the video is good enough, I'll put it up on my channel as well, so you'll be able to see it in the days to come. I, I think it was a good, good panel. Uh, what I found interesting was the extent to which woke is being taught in the schools and to where, the extent to which it is impacting kids. Um, and, uh, and, and, and how prevalent it is in the UK. I, I've known how prevalent it is in the US, but it's all over the UK. And again, it's both, I think the most woke school I've ever spoken at in the UK is Westminster. And Westminster academically might be the best school in the UK. Again, better the school, the more woke it is. Somebody actually asked, we never actually answered this question. Somebody asked, what would you prefer? Great academics, woke, not so great academics, not woke. I would go to not so great academics, not woke, because you can deal with better academics. The woke stuff becomes a part of the culture, it becomes a part of everything, and it's very different to uproot as a parent. But it's a horrible choice to have to make. Anyway, I was reading something just before the show that kind of struck me as really interesting. So this is a survey of 57,000 American undergraduates at 159 top universities. And they basically asked them um, whether they identify as LGBT or non-binary. Um, and they, they documented uh, you know, how many of them and who identified as such. Um, and then connected it to what their education was before. Now, you would expect that students who went to public schools or students who went to private schools where a lot of this woke stuff and a lot of this trans stuff and LGBT stuff was being taught would be much more likely to identify as LGBT than, let's say, homeschooled kids or kids who went to religious schools. But that is actually not the reality. And, and this is a little shocking and a little surprising. But this is the data, right? And... and you know, I, I leave it to you to think about this, okay? So I'm reading, this is from, uh, from, the, uh, from a um, uh, substack from David French. David French is a, a, a Christian, Christian conservative, an anti-Trump Christian conservative. But this has not, not got anything to do with Trump. This is just he's reporting. Um, he's reporting on the study of 57,000 American undergraduates at 159 top universities. Found that homeschooled and parochial schooled undergraduates are as or more likely to identify L as LGBT or non-binary as those from public or private school backgrounds. Here's the data. Those who attended parochial schools, and I'm reading from the article, or were homeschooled, were at least as likely in 2021 and more likely in 2022 to identify as LGBT. In 2022, for instance, female students from a parochial school background were 11 points more likely, and those from a homeschool background, three points more likely to identify as non-heterosexual compared to those from public or private school backgrounds. Non-binary and other forms of unconventional gender identity were also higher among homeschooled and parochial schooled undergraduates. 
Now, I think that's fascinating and really, really interesting. By the way, I read both Barry Weiss and David French. I read the whole spectrum out there, even some of conservatives who are big Trump supporters. I read them all, including the liberal right. Um, so isn't that interesting that maybe what happens is if you go to public school and you get exposed to a lot of this identity stuff and you get exposed to this, it's kind of no big deal and you are what you are and, uh, and, and you know, it, it, it doesn't really have an impact on your self-identification. But if you go to a parochial school or you're homeschooled, then when you go to college, you rebel against that. And therefore, you're more likely to self-identify as one of these things, whether you are or you're not, because it's a form of rebellion. And it's a form of the fact that you haven't fitted in in the past because you've been in these exclusive, conservative, religious environments. And now you're trying to fit in, and, and maybe the self-identification has to do with rebellion. Or maybe it's an indication of the fact that the culture is more powerful than the schools. And that is that the culture is promoting LGBTQ, LGBT. I mean, I believe that some people, at least particularly young people, are LGBT and certainly trans as, as a consequence of the culture, not as a consequence of how they really feel, uh, as a consequence of, of attempts to rebel, as a consequence of fitting in, as a, a lot of other things other than um, other than uh, how they really feel. I mean, they, there is a statistics about the fact that w within a trans community, it, 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 it is now almost 10 to 1, something like that, girls who want to become men versus men who want to become girls, uh, men who want to become women. Uh, and, and that's the flip side of how it was historically. And a lot of that has to do... Um, oops, is the video and sound not synchronized for you guys? Anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, there is a lot of social pressure. It's, it's like an in thing. It's a click. It's cool. Um, and uh, look, the only way to combat all of this, the only way to deal with all of this, I think, is A, I, I do believe in competition in education. I think that would be good. But that is not going to solve the, the more fundamental issues of, of sex and gender and uh, or, or, the, or the bigger issues of, of kids getting to know who they really are and, and identifying as, as who they really are or and, and you know not being influenced by social pressure and, and just general the quality of education that ultimately there has to be in addition to competition in addition to uh, to privatization education there has to be a, a philosophical revolution we have to change the way people think about everything. And that includes uh, a, a, a renewed respect for reason, um, uh, teaching kids how to think, teaching kids about um, you know, the, 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 fact, the facts of, of history, of, of, uh, of nature, of biology, of evolution, uh, which, but, but more importantly, using all those facts to get kids to use their mind to think logically. Rewarding logic, penalizing illogic, penalizing emotionalism, penalizing the inability to reason. What we need people to get is to think, to integrate. And until we do that, um, I think we're going to have we have a really really hard time dealing with again whatever wokeism of the moment is, whether it comes from the left or the right. Uh, you know, and this is primarily true in the context of morality. The whole woke critical race theory intersectionality is at the end of the day made possible, made possible by altruism. This idea of, of guilt, this idea of so-called privilege, this idea of you should feel guilty for your success, this idea of egalitarianism. All of that is a consequence and a form of, and comes from, uh, altruism.
uh, this idea that 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 you should you know that that you shouldn't live for yourself, that you shouldn't be proud of your achievements, that you shouldn't uh, strive to to make your life the best life that it can be for you. Uh, the whole notion that the focus should be on the other, and that you should be humble, and that you should deprecate yourself, and that the standard of virtue, by the way, is suffering. So the standard of virtue is oppression. The more oppressed a particular individual is, or the more he belongs to a particular group that might have been oppressed historically or is oppressed today, the more virtuous that individual is. That's all straight altruism. So we're not going to make progress against woke. We're not going to make progress against any of that without making progress for against altruism. Now, while woke is primarily a left thing, woke is made possible by Christianity, inherently by Christianity. Christianity is the philosophy of original sin, which woke, um, which woke uh, thrives on, uh, woke you know utilizes, capitalizes on. Uh, Christianity is the idea, in a sense, that you're born sinful. Well, certainly, if you're white, uh, according to according to white fragility, that is true. Uh, you know, it is Christianity that builds into morality and makes morality equal altruism and makes altruism and e e morality the same and therefore makes suffering and, uh, and, 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 uh, and um, you know, oppression a standard by which you should measure people's morality. That is, again, intersectionality to the T. Without Christianity, none of this is possible. And without undoing the damage Christianity has done, without challenging the beliefs of Christianity, primarily on the ethics, primarily on the altruism, you will never get rid of some crazy kind of left. So what needs to be addressed, what needs to be challenged is the philosophy that unites the left and the right. And that is the philosophy of altruism the philosophy of, let's call it anti-reason, the philosophy of collectivism that unites left and right. I mean, I think Leonard Peikoff makes this point that Marxism is, to a large extent, uh, or, or, or is, uh, to a large extent, a secularization of Christianity, replacing the, the proletarian with God, replacing the, 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 the dictatorship for the Pope or the church, the church in capital C, um, and, uh, you know, communing with the spirits and applying the same kind of platonic philosophy to Christianity has been applied to um, uh, to the proletarian. So, our battle is a huge one, because it is not just a battle against woke. If you defeat woke, something else will arise instead of it. Somebody else, something else will arise to replace it. And if you defeat woke and allow the right to win, then the right will replace woke with their uh, religious teachings, with their religious indoctrination, which again is directly um, in the. Uh, uh, the doctrine of uh, national conservatism. It's not about defeating this or defeating that. It is about winning on our terms. It is about winning the philosophical battle. It's about winning the ideological battles by changing, changing the whole perspective on how to look at these issues. As I've said many times, I, I think wokeism to a large extent is, is peaking um, it's still got a runway, it's still got a lot of energy behind it, but the American people uh, are not behind woke and they reject woke. I think the British people are not behind woke and they reject woke. I think it's seeing its peak now. I, I, I don't think it's going to become bigger than it is today. It's already huge, but I don't think it's going to be bigger than it is today. I mean, you're seeing on every front, you're seeing ESG challenged, you're seeing at every front, you're seeing real challenging. Um, again, I remind you of the Virginia uh, elections and the, um, and the San Francisco recall, uh, and there's lots of other minor examples of this all over the place. There, there is a real 
there is a real um, uprising against uh, kind of the wacky left agenda. Um, and I don't think the wacky left agenda will survive. I, 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 as I've always said in the end, wackiness will survive. Wackiness will survive because wackiness is based on the, the particular wackiness. Altruism will survive. Uh, uh, collectivism will survive. Statism will survive. Authoritarianism will survive. Whether it comes from the left and right matters less than the fact that it will survive and it will have an impact on all of our lives. That's what we need to fight. We need to fight the whole caboodle. That's what makes it hard. And that's why the best solution is to privatize the schools. If you privatize the schools, you go after woke and you go after the Christian conservatives. You go after a whole bunch of them. I, I find it interesting. Um, the national conservatives, um, while seemingly primarily an American movement, run by an Israeli, funnily enough, Yom Hazoni. Um, they're all over the UK. So at Durham University, a kid stood up uh, after my talk and said, well, I'm a national conservative. I'm a big fan of Yom Hazoni and, you know, started arguing with me. Uh, and, and during the panel yesterday about the US election, there were a number of people who expressed clearly ideas that are based on the principles of national conservatism. This is a certainly an Anglo-Saxon world, a, a growing movement, um, and, uh, and uh, I think a powerful movement and a very, very, very dangerous movement, as dangerous as anything the left has to propose to us, and more palatable to the American and the British people than what the left has to peddle. Um, all right. Yeah, Robin says, evil is impotent, only sanction of the good gives it power. And I think that's right. And, and in, in, the, in, the, in the case of education, the sanction th is given by the parents. The sanction is primarily given by the parents' silence by the parents' acquiescence, by the parents not challenging the evil that is being taught in the schools. Now, there's some limit to the ability to do that, but most of it is just laziness and apathy and fear. And again, private education forces parents, forces parents to actually get involved, to actually make a choice, to actually go and choose, to actually do the research, to actually be there. Um, so that is, uh, that is interesting, but it is good to see as, as on this panel, we had two parents, a British one and an American one, both, both, um, challenging their respective schools, both engaged in the battle, both very active and very passionate about this. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.